والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته With the grace of Allah the Almighty Khaybar now is at the hands of the Muslims The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had an agreement with them that they may work in the farms of Khaybar providing that they give half of whatever comes out to the Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ has all the right to send them out of Khaybar whenever he wishes to do so at that time the Prophet ﷺ came to know that his cousin Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and all the Muslims that or who were in Abyssinia mig migrating in Abyssinia 10 years ago came back to Medina with Amr ibn Umayyah al-Dumari and he was so pleased to see them and to see the Ash'ariyeen the tribe of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari may Allah be pleased with him coming and he was so happy he said that I don't know which one to be happy more with with the arrival of Jafar or with Khaybar being granted to me by Allah the Almighty the companions who were in Abyssinia came to Medina to find a different world than what they were used to remember they fled the oppression of the polytheist in Mecca four or five years before Hijra. So they left the Arabian Peninsula with the Muslims being oppressed. They are fearful of the polytheist and their oppression. They don't have a platform to call people to Islam, let alone to be able to live in a Muslim society and Muslim environment. Now when they came back, every, the, t the tables were turned. They found that the upper hand was for the Muslims. Everyone feared them, respected them, and allowed them to do their da'wah work without any interference. They had a truce with the people of Mecca, and the people of Mecca had everything to fear for because those whom they kicked in the very beginning out of Mecca are now more stronger than, them, than the people of Mecca. So when they came back from Abyssinia, it was a completely different, different environment. Islam was practiced and it was the norm. It was a dominating religion. The Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, was filled with companions. They are with the Prophet ﷺ and he's teaching them and he's uh, uh, solving their problems and he is taking care of them. They were happy. Among them was Asma bint Umais. May Allah be pleased with her. She was the wife of Jafar ibn Abi Talib. And in one hadith we are told that she was visiting Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her, and Umar ibn Khattab entered the house. And he asked Hafsa, while Asma was listening, who's this with you? So 
she said it's Asma bint Umais. And listen to the description of Umar. Umar, may Allah please with her, with him, said, uh, the one of the boat, the Abyssinian one, and he's saying this just to show her that yeah, and you're, you're nothing compared to the companions that migrated from Medina to Mecca, <clears throat> from Mecca to Medina. Medina. And he started saying and telling her that you have no migration like us. We migrated with the Prophet Sallallahu while you went to Abyssinia, you did not migrate with the Prophet Sallallahu So she was extremely angry and frustrated and said that you, Umar, was with the Prophet وسلم, you and your companions, you were with the Prophet, he would feed your hungry, and he would take care of the one who was needy, while we were in a foreign land, in a foreign language, and we were so far away, we did not know what was going to happen with us. You were with the Prophet وسلم, he used to teach you, he used to take care of you. We were alone in Abyssinia, and you claim that we don't have any migration, by Allah, I will go to the Prophet والسلام, and I will tell him exactly what you have said and I would not add or delete anything. And she went to the Prophet والسلام, and she told him what took place. And the Prophet والسلام, smiled and said, you and your companions are rewarded by, the, by Allah جل, twice. Because you migrated twice, once to Abyssinia and once to Medina, while Umar and his companions only migrated once. once. So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari tells us that the companions who were in Abyssinia were never ever happier than when they heard this hadith on and on and on from Asma bint Umais. Asma bint Umais, by the way, is a great companion of the Prophet and she at first was married to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and when he died in the battle of Mu'ta as a martyr she married Abu Bakr Siddiq and he, when he died she married Ali ibn Abi Talib imagine this great woman, this great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, she gave him three sons. One of them was Muhammad ibn Ja'far. Abu Bakr Siddiq, she gave him one son, and that was Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. So she had two sons by the name of Muhammad. Muhammad. And once the story says that while she was married to Ali, Muhammad ibn Ja'far and Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, all had a, a, a fight, not a fight, but they all disputed. And each one of them started saying that my father is better than your father. Yeah. Of course, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was the cousin of the Prophet والسلام, and he was the beloved cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. He looked like the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Bakr, of course, is it's needless to say that he's the top in ranking among the Muslims. He is the, the beloved friend of the Prophet ﷺ who believed him and was the first to accept Islam when the Prophet ﷺ started calling people to Islam. So both of them are high caliber, but without no doubt, who's the best? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. You have no doubt, none whatsoever. Abu Bakr is the best companion of all, followed by Umar, followed by Uthman, and then followed by Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib. So both boys, Muhammad ibn Ja'far and Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, each one said that my father was better than yours. So Ali ibn Abi Talib told their mother to say a statement to relieve both of them. So she looked at them and said, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was the best among the youth. And Abu Bakr was the best among the old oh. and veteran. And ja Ali ibn Abi Talib said, you haven't left anything for me. And he was her husband, the third husband. And he said, you have not left anything. If Ja'far is the best among the youth, the youngsters, and Abu Bakr is the best among 
the uh, veterans. So what's left for me? So she told him that freeze, a freedom, that you are the worst among them is, is, is something that is of a, a high status. If you are the third among Ja'far and Abu Bakr, then this is not, this is not a bad thing to be. By the way, Asma bint Umais, marriage to these three great men, tells us that in Islam, it is not an insult to be widowed or to be divorced. And this is a misconception that some so-claimed Muslims may have. They may look at a, a, a divorced woman as a second class yeah. or something that has been used. Yeah. And this is not true at all. If you read the seerah and if you read the biography of all the companions, you would find that lots of the Muslim female companions got married more than two or three times. This was normal because you cannot guarantee that life goes on smooth with the couple. And maybe a person dies during a war or, or due to an accident or to an illness or something. So it is not advised in Islam to leave a woman without a husband. On the contrary, if you look at the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, you will find that a lot of them were either widowed or lost a husband to an unfortunate uh, uh, event. And the Prophet ﷺ married them in order to compensate them in a sense for the calamity that took place with them. Yeah, I was about to say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi only one virgin woman, the Sayyidah Aisha, and uh, the other was... Uh, yes, the that's, that's completely yeah. true. Yeah. And this tells you that Islam protects each and every individual. Yeah. And the Prophet Sallallahu told us that he who takes care of a widow or an orphan is with me on the day of judgment like this. And he pointed with his two fingers. Mm. And he told us also in another hadith that he who takes care of the widow or an orphan is like a person fighting for the sake of Allah. Though he is, he is in his city, in his house, yet he is rewarded as those who are fighting uh, uh, in the cause of Allah the Almighty. Isma bint Umais also, by the way, was the sister-in-law of the Prophet because her sister, Maymuna bint al-Harith, was the mother of the believers, and we will come, inshallah, to talk uh, uh, about her later on. After the battle of Khaybar, the Prophet, والسلام, saw among the slaves uh, one of uh, 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 the Jew women. Her name was Safiya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab. She had an issue, and this issue, inshallah, is what we will discuss after the break, so stay tuned. <laughs> So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. The Prophet ﷺ had the prisoners of Khaybar and the slaves that were enslaved. Among them was Safiya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab. And she was the daughter of Huyay ibn Akhtab, one of the dignitaries of Bani al-Nadir. And she was also the wife of Kenana ibn Rabi' ibn Abi Haqiq, one of the dignitaries of Khaybar. 
she was enslaved and after distributing the uh, the booty of Khaybar Dihya ibn Khalifa al-Kilbi may Allah be pleased with him had Safiya in his share so one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ went to the Prophet and said, O Prophet of Allah, Dihya won Safiya in his chair, in his share of the booty. But because she is the daughter of their dignitary and she is the elite of the women of the Jews, she is not suitable for anyone except for yourself. So the Prophet ﷺ brought her and he introduced Islam to her. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, she accepted Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ set her free and married her and restored her position to her back again after she was the wife and the daughter of the dignitaries of the Jews. Now she is the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the mother of the believers, and she became to be the mother of the believers, and she was highly loved by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi She was a very good person, and all the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi were good and and and, and pious uh, uh, wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also, after Khaybar was the battle of Khaybar was over. The Prophet ﷺ received an invitation from the wife of Salam ibn Mashkam, a Jew. A Jew woman sent an invitation to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ went. And not knowing that this woman had an idea, a devious idea, and that is to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. She asked those who knew the Prophet ﷺ, about the best part of a sheep that he usually likes. And they told her that he likes the arm. So she put a lot of poison in the arm and shoulder area. And she cooked this sheep and gave it to the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. Which tells us that it is permissible for a Muslim to attend and accept the invitation of a non-Muslim. Yeah. Now, this was a Jew, and it was at the time of battle. Nevertheless, because he was invited, he attended, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he started to eat him and one of his companion, Bishr ibn al-Bara ibn Ma'rur, may Allah be pleased with him. Bishr took one bite, and some narrations, the Prophet ﷺ took one bite and spit it out immediately. Bishr, because he was first, he did not Life. spit it out, he swallowed it. And the Prophet ﷺ told his companions, do not eat from the sheep, that sheep, because it just spoke to me and told me that it was poisonous. Bishr, may Allah be pleased with him, suffered, some narrations say, uh, uh, for a while, to a period of one year. Some narrations say, no, he died instantly. But it appears that he, it took him a while, a few months before he died. Some narrations tell us that he told the Prophet ﷺ that by Allah, I felt that the taste was not right, but I could not spit it, spit it out in your presence, O Prophet of Allah, so I swallowed it. The Prophet tells us, والسلام, or the story tells us that the Prophet ﷺ gathered the Jews. And in another narration, he brought the woman. And the narration in Al-Bukhari tells us that he gathered the Jews and told them, O oh Jews, I will ask you a question. Will you be truthful with me and not saying any lies? They said, yes, of course, we will do that. So he told them, who is your father? And this is a question when you ask someone about his lineage, not who is your straight father, who is your great great grand uh, uh, father. <clears throat> so they said, so and so, to a name that was not right. true. true. So the Prophet said, Sam, you have lied. Your father is so, so and so. So they admitted and said, 
you know best Abu Qasim. This is what you've said is true. So again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked them, I'll ask you another question. Will you be truthful? He said, Allah will tell you if we would say a lie, like he did when you yeah. told us about our real father. Yeah. So he told them, who will be in hell? So they said, the Jews will be in hell for just a while, and then we will go out. And the Prophet said, you have lied. May Allah's curse be upon you. You will be there forever. And then he said, I'll ask you another question. And can you be truthful? And they said, you know, you've told us two out of three and you've discovered that we were telling lies. So we will tell you the truth. So he asked them a straight question. Have you put poison in this sheep? And the Jews said, yes, we have. And we, and this is exactly the same answer that the woman gave. And when asked why, they said, and she said, that we wanted to see if you were a prophet or a king. Yeah. If you were a king, you would have, it would have killed you, and we would have relieved the, from you. the, the, the world from you. Yeah. But if you were a prophet, then Good. Allah will inform you and tell you. And you will As usual, the Prophet ﷺ set the woman free. He pardoned her because whatever took place with him والسلام, he would set them free but after a while after Bishr ibn al-Bara died then yeah. the, he had to execute, execute her him. because she killed him and this is exactly what took place also on this year and after the event of uh, Khaybar it was made forbidden for Muslims to eat the meat of donkeys, as mentioned before. And also it was made forbidden for Muslims to marry a particular kind of marriage, which is known as muta. Mm -hmm. And in English, it might be translated into enjoyment. Enjoy, yeah. And this marriage was allowed twice and then finally made forbidden till the day of judgment. And it was allowed due to particular circumstances and the formality of this type of marriage would be to agree a man and a woman to agree on a particular dowry and to have the marriage limited for a particular time a particular period of time so a man could propose to a woman and tell her that I would like to marry you for two weeks so on the 14th day Without divorce, without any commitment, yeah. the, the marriage is void and it's considered to be invalid. Mm -hmm. And she goes her way and he goes his way. This was allowed in the very beginning. But now, uh, uh, at the last uh, uh, time, it was made forbidden. Some say it was made forbidden after the Battle of Autas and some say it was in Khaybar. Either way, it was made forbidden uh, upon Muslims to marry this kind of marriage and this is the consensus of scholars of Sunnah uh, uh, scholars they all agree on this and it is actually a form of adultery it was permissible yeah. for a certain period of time for a certain group of yeah. people because they were in deep need of this it's like when someone is stranded in the desert and he has no food except a, a, a pork meat yeah. or a, a dead meat or he does not have drink except Wine. wine, but this is another issue because yeah. scholars say even <clears throat> wine is not permissible for you to drink when you are almost dying of, out of yeah. thirst because it would increase your thirst. It will not yeah. relieve you from your th thirst. Scholars say that it was permitted for this particular reason, for the need that the Muslims had at that time. But now if you look at it, it's a form of adultery. If someone goes to a woman and tells her that I'd like to marry you for two hours for $100. Yeah. And then after two hours, after he got what he wants and she got what he, she wanted, the marriage is over. This is not marriage. Not marriage true. is a long-term contract where both parties participate in with the approval of the guardian, with the dowry, with the intention of having children and establishing a family. But 
to have it for such a period of time and it's limited and it's by default void, this is not acceptable in Islam. On the battle of Khaybar, some stories, though the fighting was fierce and strong, some uh, uh, narrations say that 16 died from the Muslims and others say it was about 18. While the, uh, the number of deaths among the Jews was higher and greater. And this, is, this was due to the fact that most of the fights were either a duel or what was uh, caused by the archers from the Jews' side uh, uh, shooting and throwing their arrows at the Muslims. There was not a confrontation in the sense of an army facing another army. So there is no there is no uh, big fighting. It's only arrows only. Yes, and and and, and duels probably. Yeah. Now among the other villages around was the village of Fadak, and Fadak themselves, they were of Jews, and just as the Prophet ﷺ was at Khaybar, they sent their envoys to the Prophet ﷺ, telling them, telling him that we surrender, no need yeah. even to come and do anything. And they've agreed with the Prophet ﷺ to work in their village and to give him half of what they make out of that. After that, the Prophet ﷺ moved to Wadi Al-Qura, where it had some Jews and Arabs, polytheists there. Yeah. And he also besieged that village. But inshallah, we will try to continue talking about this uh, uh, expedition when we meet next time, until then, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.